Hello and welcome to BIMSTORM Data Independence. This is Kimon Onuma. Today's session is on data-driven design and fabrication. We're going to be updating on the Solano Community College's biotech building and give you an update on that project from last week. Um, and then we're also going to be covering some new material as well, a lot of new material. And we have some guests with us today. Uh, my name is Kimon Onuma. We have Thomas Dalbert from Onuma. Uh, James Buchanan, the Director of Facilities from Solano Community College. Uh, Mike Eggers, uh, Vice President of uh, Project Frog. And Dara Duraghi, Studio Director from Project Frog. So one thing, uh, on the, your GoToWebinar interface on the right side, there's a pop-up window. And there's a, a panel that's called Questions. Uh, we'll be taking questions uh, from the audience. Um, by typing in the question, we'll be cataloging them, and if we, depending on how much time we have at the end of the webinar, we'll cover some of those questions, but feel free to type questions as they come up, uh, and we'll be reviewing them and getting back to them at the, the end of the webinar. We want to thank our sponsors. These BIM storms are free to attend and participate. Um, Fox Blocks in Vicara and others that have supported us. Uh, thank you very much for sponsoring and participating as well. We had a lot of participants from the sponsors uh, and supporters from the Asset Leadership Network, Building Smart Alliance, Wisconsin Department of Health, and others that have been giving us support uh, throughout these BIM storms. Um, the focus has been on uh, owners, the AEC industry, and app developers. Today we are going to be talking actually about all three. We'll be touching on app developers at the very end. We have the owner from the Solano Community Colleges facilities and the uh, architectural community and be running through some sample exercises as well. So Jim, um, thanks for joining us again from last week. We had a really interesting session last week where you um, uh, presented what's happening at the, uh, the biotech building on, in Vacaville. Um, would you like to say a few words about uh, um, just a brief intro about the community colleges and then we'll focus on biotech first, but go ahead. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, well, thanks for having me, and welcome, everybody. I'm James Buchanan, Director of Facilities here at Solano Community College. A um, little bit about Solano Community College. Uh, we have our basically five campuses, our main campus being Fairfield, and then we have our Vallejo Center, our Vacaville Center, our Annex, and our Auto Tech Center. Um, it's about uh, 500 and... Five, 500 and just over 500,000 square feet and with a total of about 36, 36 buildings. Um, and that's an overview of our campus and uh, we're adding a new auto tech center that's uh, 32,000 square feet and a new uh, biotech uh, building that's an additional uh, 30,000 square feet. And then we're going also uh, going to be um, the, uh, adding a new science building that will be on the main campus that will be approximately uh, 36,000 square feet. So that's a, a slight overview of, of our campus. And did you want me to speak about the progress that we've made since last week in our um, um, hardening up or what we wanted to see our construction teams put into the uh, uh, preventive maintenance? Yeah, that would be great. Actually, this is an image from the biotech the building information model that was uh, worked with, you know, built with Revit and other tools uh, with the AEC team that's listed down below. And last week, we were going through <clears throat> how the data can be formatted for delivery back into uh, facility management applications. Um, and I think you and Thomas uh, last week presented the uh, Excel workbook that had a list of uh, equipment types and you had an updated uh, um, planning um, study to update the information here uh, with you uh, last week, toward the end of last week, right? So maybe you yes, can Thomas, describe that process. Sure. Thomas Delbert and myself uh, sat down and uh, had, had a meeting regarding um, what we wanted to see, what was important to the facilities management team uh, to be implemented into my preventive maintenance program. So we were asking the uh, developers um, and construction team to uh, input certain information for us. So what we did is we went through and just um, 
defined what, what we wanted to see um, in our systems. There was a lot of areas that we don't want to see, you know, the, the little nuts and bolts of the system. We didn't want to see uh, flush valves, um, toilets, sinks, faucets, um, door hardware. We didn't want to see that type of thing. What we wanted to see were the uh, bigger items that would pertain to preventive maintenance, such as our um, air handling units, uh, all of our mechanical equipment, such as chillers, boilers, condensers, uh, VAV valves, uh, hot water heaters, exhaust fans, diffusers, uh, our uh, Phoenix valves for our uh, fume hoods, our fume hood system, uh, backflow preventers, refrigeration systems, pumps, recirculating pumps, um, sliding doors, ADA uh, uh, button actuators, and also we had uh, the doors and the door finish also uh, type of doors that we wanted to list. Uh, gate valves, roofing system, and then of, of that equipment, what we wanted, what we wanted to see was uh, then, then we drilled down on exactly what we wanted to see from that equipment, such as um, warranties, a start of the warranty, end of warranty, um, life expectancy of the product, initial cost of the product. Um, then on our, uh, we wanted to see cooling capacities of our HVAC systems uh, on the hot water and cold in the uh, in chilled water side. Uh, we wanted to see the information our, on our VAVs, on our chillers, hot water heaters, pumps, doors, hardware um, that, that the design team could put in for us so that we could extract this information uh, from the, from the uh, Excel workbook and uh, extract that into our new preventive maintenance uh, work order system so that we could have the ability to create uh, new PMs for all this new equipment that we're having at these three buildings. Um, here at Solana, we have a very small management team of myself, an assistant director, and an administrative assistant. So for us to sit down and, and, and try and collect all this data by ourselves would be a, a virtually impossible task for us. So that's what Thomas and I uh, uh, discussed last week and kind of defined those parameters, what we wanted to see. Right. So what we're looking at on screen is an updated Excel file that you and Thomas actually went through piece by piece and listed the objects, or the components that you want to track information on that you're expecting the AEC team to deliver. It's a subset of the building. You even added some more that were assumed last week that you did not need, and those were turned on back in the model. That's what this little screenshot here is here on the right, that additional electrical components were decided to be included. So now yeah. there's a complete list or an Excel that was posted back to the, um, the model, the website for the BIMSTORM and everybody that's actually um, participating in the BIMSTORM can actually get access to this as well as a team that's going to be submitting for the actual project back on biotech is my understanding where we are, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, this is Thomas Stalberg. Thomas, yeah, yeah, go ahead. I, I, uh, yeah, that's right. It's linked to the building, so anybody who goes in there and looks at that building, you can uh, look at the attachments for that specific biotech building for Vacamel uh, and, and download those files if you're interested in seeing what, what we determined or what uh, <clears throat> the facility management team and, and uh, Jim Buchanan uh, decided that would be important to collect the type of data. Uh, we also added this column, this 1 p.m. Uh, procedures column, so for, the, for whatever, every single I, uh, type of, of uh, asset that has a X in that column means that uh, they want to see a, the procedures for, for the maintenance, uh, preventive maintenance. Yep. Right. Okay, so yeah, this is Excel file and it's available for those that um, so this is an actual, again, we reiterating, this is an actual live project that's under construction right now and we're getting a really great glimpse into what an owner like uh, Solano wants to have uh, back for this project at Vacaville. 
and um, it's interesting because this is at, at toward the middle and the end of the project as in construction, but it's going to be applied to new projects as they come in in the future as well too. So it's a good prototype that's going to be applied to the other projects on the campus. Um, so it's a unique opportunity for all of us that are participating, participating in BIMSTORM to see firsthand what that really means. Um, so Jim, I'd like to kind of fast forward a little bit and um, go into the Fairfield campus where um, there's a master plan that was uh, produced uh, a year or so ago, a couple of years ago by STV VBN. Um, and on that master plan, uh, some new buildings have been identified. These are future buildings that could be coming up. Do you want to describe a little bit about the master plan and um, your view of it? Well, I've been here only for about two years right now, uh, Kimo, so the master plan, I'm, I'm, I'm familiar, familiar with it, but um, the one we're moving forward first that was identified on the master plan is our science building, um, which we're, we're going to be building. Uh, we're also going to be adding a, um, a new, um, let me take a look at this one here, our new performing arts. Right now we're re remodeling the existing performance, performing arts building. It's getting a complete renovation. Um, and then there will be uh, possibly in the future additions to that. Um, we all, we're also looking at uh, our current library is approximately 48,000 uh, square feet and it was built in 1969. So it's, it's about 45, 47 years old right now. Um, and we're looking at a, a replacement of that, you know, building the new library and then tearing down the old one. Um, so we have quite a few building, quite a few projects planned uh, for the community college here on the Fairfield campus, which consists of 192 acres, um, about 500,000 square feet. And um, currently right now we have 26 buildings on the main campus on site. But uh, overall, we have a total of uh, uh, 30, uh, 33 buildings throughout the um, satellite campuses and the main campus. Um, so we're, we're, our next building that we're going to erect here in the next, uh, we'll start construction the next year, will be our new uh, science and math building that will be located right in front of the 1500 building right there in the, in the main courtyard of the campus. So, and that, you know, that building is going to be roughly 36,000 square feet. It's going to, um, it's going to house our anatomy classes, our labs, uh, science lecture halls, our veterans uh, center. Uh, that's very important to the campus that we, that we give them a nice area that they can uh, come and retreat to and have a place to gather, you know, and, and, and uh, speak about their, you know, classes and situations. And that will be part of the science building also. So we're really looking forward to, to, this, to this project and um, looking forward to the future buildings also on campus. Great. So our exercise today, or the webinar actually, is uh, entitled uh, Data Driven Design uh, and Fabrication. So we're fast forward now. We, we heard about the biotech building that's being completed, and now we're going to run through a simulation of what it would look like if we started from the very beginning of the project with the data requirements for a new math and science building. We're going to focus in on the math and science building and uh, we're going to uh, simulate building uh, rapidly doing a plan that matches the master plan uh, scenario here. Um, in previous webinars we described how uh, standards for spaces and equipment uh, are available to the BIMSTORM teams to use. So you can call up typical classrooms or typical offices or conference rooms and start building up uh, room by room. Uh, we're going to fast forward a little bit and start from the site planning level and run through an exercise now. And I'm going to go away from uh, PowerPoint for a little bit and just go straight to a website here that we've been using for the BIM Storm. Uh, this is actually the same tools that uh, Solano is using right now uh, for managing the facilities. Um, we've uh, layered in, uh, this is on a website actually, so we're seeing a map uh, view of the campus scenario, uh, Google map view. We've layered in the, uh, the master plan on top of that so we can actually see the kind of before and after, so current condition, um, and then the proposed condition. So currently there is a, um, a place in the middle of the campus that has the existing math building, I believe it is, uh, right here. The existing math building, the 1500 building. The 1500 building is right here. 
Right. And there's a, a grassy area to the north, and the proposed master plan looks like it's proposing to keep, possibly keep the existing math building and build a new math and science building wing to the north of it. Um, so what we've done is um, use that as a guide, and then we've uh, layered some buildings here off to the side. Uh, and we're going to open these up as well, too. But conceptually, when you're doing a quick plan like this, the idea is that we want to not only work with uh, shapes and things, but we also want to see information about those buildings. So for example, if you say, well, if we, what options do we have to fill in this, this uh, master planning scenario here? We could put a building like that. We, we could turn it around. So it's a quick study. And, and while we're doing this, data is being generated about initial cost and square footage and things like that and building a BIM here on the fly. So that's part of the BIM storm process is how do we collaborate and if, Jim, if you're the uh, facilities, uh, representing the facilities uh, or, or the district, maybe in a planning exercise, we're saying, okay, well, what do you want? Let's try different options. Should we do it like this or should we put the building over here or do we even want to possibly even consider taking down the existing math and science building and building two new buildings? Uh, that's still, um, part of a planning exercise we're doing one if what if scenarios like this. Um, then if we open up one of these buildings, let's look inside this classroom building here. The next part of this exercise is we're going to be interacting with uh, a group called Project Frog, who's online right now, uh, Mike and Dara. And um, I'm wearing the architects and hi Dara and Mike, thanks for joining us. Um, we want to run through a, a, a planning exercise using uh, your uh, building data, and maybe you could describe a little bit first about what you guys do a little bit. We'll, we'll go to slides for a few slides and jump back to the um, um, live planning exercise. Well, why don't you introduce Project Frog a little bit so everybody knows the context of what we're going to be doing and why you're online. Okay, so I'll, I'll take over from here. This is uh, Mike Eggers from Project Frog. Um, so Project Frog, uh, we're a prefabricated um, componentized building system. Um, probably a lot of you are familiar with modular buildings, um, and we, we actually kind of sit in between modular and traditional, um, always focusing on three key things when we design, uh, design our kit of parts, um, really designing for manufacturing, number one, we have a network of manufacturers throughout North America that we work with uh, to produce all the parts and pieces of, of our uh, kit building. Um, designing for delivery, how do we get it efficiently to, from manufacturer to site? Uh, and then ultimately when it hits site, how do we design for assembly so it's easy to go together. Um, and it's a kind of easy intuitive experience for the general contractors that work with our kit of parts. Um, maybe get to, hop to the next slide. So as I mentioned, we sit you know, in between traditional and modular. Um, modular you know, is, a, is a very fast to market product. Uh, we, we're very competitive with the speed of modular, but we, we offer a lot of flexibility that you can't get with modular. Um, and we, we really are approaching toward the amount of flexibility you get with traditional construction without taking the speed hit. Um, not ultimate flexibility, but you know, we, we provide a lot of customization and a lot of um, a lot of ways to reconfigure our buildings within a set kit of parts so we're kind of this nice middle ground we offer a lot of the speed efficiency and manufacturing tolerance um, that you can get on a modular design without um, fixing you into a very uh, limited range of options and maybe we can kind of skip over the next slide. I think this I kind of covered this in the first one um, we also take a platform approach um, to our kit of parts and really the whole ecosystem that we design. I, I use this image to kind of hit home the idea in the, in the automotive industry, the idea of a platform approach. Um, you have on the top here a Fiat 500X, the bottom a Jeep Renegade, actually the same exact platform um, and very different products that you can, you can get from this common platform. If you can hit next, I think it'll pop up our uh, building images, but we, we take the same approach, right? How do you produce um, from shared SKUs, shared design and engineering resources, <coughs> common, <coughs> excuse me, common documentation, um, a manufacturing network and supply chain, and really a technology stack that underpins all of that. At the end of the day, you, you know, you can create a lot of different building types from that. Um, 
and and then as we as we have that underpinning technology stack, um, really how do we go direct to manufacturing with our kit components? So eliminating shop drawings um, and cutting the time to manufacturing ready. So we can automate that process. We have a video we'll show later on that demonstrates the automation there. Go to the next slide. And then this is just uh, some images of some of the buildings we've done in the past. This is our two-story, one of our two-story typologies. Um, you can see definitely not the feel of modular construction. It looks very much like, uh, I like to say, architecture with a capital A. Um, permanent buildings, um, you know, if, if you looked at them, you would think these were stick-built um, and maybe even custom buildings. This is kind of our, you know, very much goes with our brand, these kind of really beautiful interiors, exposed glam beams. Uh, metal deck, uh, really great learning environments for the kids. So, um, very much the feeling of permanent architecture, which it is, um, with all the flexibility, speed, and efficiency you get with prefabrication and componentized construction. Um, great, thanks, Mike. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to switch over to. We're going to come back to the slides again after the live exercise. But from what I've heard you say, you have a platform that we have to follow certain rules to fit within that platform, but there's a lot of flexibility. It's not your typical modular buildings that maybe a lot of us are used to. It actually has a nice capabilities of uh, uh, supporting the architectural needs that uh, you would have in a exactly. campus. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, but within within certain rules, obviously, and that that's actually help helps us as a designer. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to switch and put my architect's hat on, and I'm going to want to have a dialogue with you guys as we go through this planning exercise of this new math and science building. And the other, if we switch back to the data uh, uh, theme that we have today, the data-driven design, obviously if you have a platform then you have a lot of data in these buildings that support the dimensional needs of uh, a room like this, but also the manufacturing needs, which we'll show toward the end, and also the data delivery back to the owner, which is what James talked about earlier. When a building like this is completed and uh, Solano needs to maintain and manage this building if you deliver not only the building but the information that goes into the building, the type of lights and the type of windows and doors and panels. That's also very valuable as we saw to an owner. So that's actually an opportunity for us as the AEC industry to not only produce great design but produce great data that goes along with it. Would you agree with that great statement? And I think you guys are, what, what drew me to a lot of the work that you guys are doing is that that thinking is, uh, the platform thinking, the data thinking is pretty exciting if you think about it like that. Absolutely, yes. Great. Okay, so Dara's on now, and Dara and I are going to, we have this prototypical layout here, and this is, again, as part of the brainstorm, those that participate get access to these tools and the actual data that we're running here. Um, but we have these uh, modular pieces of classrooms that are fitting into this, this grid here, and we have to work within certain rules, I believe, right, Dara? So if I wanted to, uh, for example, um, um, say I want a larger room, um, obviously I can uh, graphically stretch this out, but I know that uh, this edge is 32 feet, and if I want this to be, what's the next module that's possible here? Is it? Uh, 40. It's 8 foot modules on the horizontal. Eight foot. So if I go eight, eight, uh, 40 feet here, then that would be a possibility from a design perspective. I can actually have a larger room possibly here on the end, right? It has other implications obviously here, but right. that's the type of discussion I think that we can have. Like we could say, okay, we want a typical classroom here, but maybe this needs to be more of a laboratory space or meeting room or whatever, but within a certain set uh, size. Um, and the other things that we could do from a planning perspective, as Jim was talking about the campus, we know that we have this uh, courtyard that we're working with and maybe uh, this lobby really needs to be on the other side of the building, so we could just say, okay, let's, let's actually drag this over and, and make the design that uh, takes that into account. How do we uh, work with a building that uh, needs a lobby on the other side? So that's another p potential planning scenario. Um, obviously, the completed design, uh, the design is not complete yet, but we're dealing with the programmatic requirements of a building like this, and I'm not going to go through all the design iterations. We can pretty much imagine what's possible here. From an owner's perspective, and this is very similar to the work that we showed in previous webinars for the health care planning for the Department of Veterans Affairs, there are typical room sizes and types and configuration and furniture and equipment that's needed in each room, and we don't have to reinvent the wheel each time if we have access to that data. Again, it's all a data-driven thing. How many seats do we need in this classroom? And then from the Project Frog perspective, it's how big can it can the room be and what uh, what size can uh, um, 
that side of the wall be and we, even where the openings are. I think maybe, in, in fact, I think you have some slides later on, Dara, about the shear walls and everything, but I'm not thinking about those right now. I'm just thinking in terms of the layout of this building. But can you give me any more input of what type of dialogue might happen at this early phase of design and um, from your perspective? Sure, yes. So there's a series of rules that we have to abide with here, uh, as I mentioned, along the horizontal axis. Uh, it's based on eight foot modules and then on the vertical axis it's based on six foot modules and then we can provide three widths for the corridors for instance that uh, goes from eight foot to twelve foot to twenty feet uh, in the middle and also uh, we have another rule structural rule that uh, the top portion of the building and the bottom portion of the building can be only offset twenty five percent of the total length of the building Okay. So those are a series of rules that uh, we need to work with. Right. Okay. So if I get within range, and even if I'm breaking some of the rules, you could either guide me as we're doing an exercise like this, or I could send this to you, and you could continue the design. Maybe we should talk about that process Correct. a little bit, because I yeah. found that pretty interesting. I'm, I'm doing a quick layout here. All I'm thinking about now is, do, am I, do I have the right number of classrooms in? I'm not worried about the wall systems or anything here. Um, but what does Project Frog do with something like this? It could be a napkin sketch, or it could be a CAD file, or it could be a BIM file like we're looking at here. But in this case, we're looking at BIM. But yeah. what would you do next with uh, something like this? So uh, right now, we will take advantage of your uh, Odema platform, the XML transfer file. So the file can be transferred in XML format uh, to Frog. And in uh, on our side, we will do structural validation of uh, of the building, and uh, we can go to the slides and I can show you how okay, that's done. Yeah. I'm just going through what you just described, so I'm basically exporting from here an XML file that's online. I've, I've decided this configuration is good. I got the lobby on this side. I didn't resolve all the hallways and other buildings, but I'm yeah. telling you I want the lobby on the right side. And then we're going to switch over to your slides now. I'm just going to show a few of the concepts here. And I could even have discussions about, you know, Sloping ceiling, whatever. Is this what it's going to look like, actually? Is this a sloping ceiling? Yeah, it's sloping here, right? Yeah. So do I have a slope or not? It could be a slope okay, ceiling so. or it could be a flat ceiling. Mm -hmm. And you have height, um, a range of heights that are possible or a fixed height. Uh, Correct. Actually, okay, what ahead. we provide is a 13.5 feet to bottom of deck. So unlike uh, most modular uh, buildings, we do provide a very high ceiling. And also, you get a lot of natural light. So here, okay. you have the data transfer from Onuma system to Frog through XML. We get that uh, floor plan, and uh, we plug it into Revit, and we go through a panelization process. And as you can see, we can, uh, we can assign different panel types uh, to each wall. So you can have a window wall, you can have a door wall, you can have a um, clear story wall, or solid panels. They could be non-structural solid panels, or it could be uh, shear panels. So uh, there's a back and forth between us and between the clients uh, in order to be able to define the building. So this is the panelization process. And after that, uh, we call it the frog component model, which is set based on the back and forth that we've gone through. So what you see here is our component model. And you see the elements that we will provide uh, as a part of the kit. So uh, as part of frog kit, we provide glue lamp beams, wall panels, glazing system, light fixture, and steel hangers, uh, and also the roof deck. And all of this that you see here was informed basically uh, based on a process that was uh, on the previous slide. So the glue lamp beams here are the eight foot models that you described earlier. So from a designer's perspective, I know that that's what's, being, what's, what's possible. I could decide to make that a design element in the room by exposing them, or yes. knowing that module helps me understand what the, the lighting uh, grid is going to be, and I, I see lights here too. Do you also provide light fixtures? Is that correct? Yes, we provide light fixtures. Actually, we have a proprietary light uh, system, lighting system, and we have uh, this beautiful light fixtures that we design called Lantana that we provide as a part of our kit. Okay, great. And what are the orange panels here? So the orange panels, this is showing an instance when the um, component model goes through structural validation. Here it shows areas which uh, are going to be used as shear panels. Okay, great. 
That's good to know. So actually, that's kind of interesting from James Buchanan's perspective, from a facility manager's perspective. If they have this data from the model and they have the lights, obviously, that would be of interest and the doors and window information to maintain this building when it's done. But also knowing where the shear panels are so they don't get a hole in that shear wall seems like it would be pretty important in some cases if they want to open up a... Is, is that what's really happening here? It means that if it's not orange in the future, it's possible to break through that panel or replace, change it, or how does it work? Yes. So if it's not a shear panel, you could change it in the future or even during the design process, say uh, you've gone through 75% DD effort and then you want to add another uh, window, we go, we go back, look at the model, and instantaneously we can make that decision, okay, you can add a uh, window here. So it makes decision making much easier. I see. So from the design that we were just looking at, I could say, we could, you and I could have a dialogue because I could see the model now, and I could say I want to change that window to a door or change that. Uh, is it possible to change that, that shear wall, for example? You would say, no, you can't do it here, but you might be do, able to put it on the other side of the wall. Exactly. Um, and I could uh, decide where window, windows and doors could go. So there's that flexibility, that back and forth, which goes back to the data part of this. Because you already have this figured out on your side from an engineering perspective, it actually lets me as a designer make more rapid decisions. Um, so one more question. At this point, we're we even be pretty early on in the design and we're having very specific discussions, but I imagine quantities and cost and that type of information is in your database. So you could start even providing that kind of input, is that correct? Correct. We keep track of all that information uh, through schedules. And uh, so essentially for us is an end-to-end -to -end transfer of data. And uh, while we are creating the model, we actually have our supply chain team very involved early on. And they help us uh, with managing that data as well. And then as you see here, uh, you could also, through automation, extract panels out of the model and create shop drawings. And uh, through these shop drawings, we are able to keep track of all the fasteners, all the bolts, uh, all the shear panels, all the, uh, the different elements that go into the uh, creation of these panels. And we go again through this XML file transfer that goes to a fabricator, one of our uh, uh, network fabricators in, throughout North America. And then in real time, they're able to uh, cut those panels using their CNC machines. Interesting. So the XML here is an output from your model now and have it to the fabricators and it gives them information on how to cut the panels. But it's inter again, since we're focusing on data, it's a good topic here because you actually imported an XML from my preliminary design layout that I did, imported that XML into Revit, used that to generate the, the, the model that you then added more detail to with the panelization and the families that you use and now you have an XML that goes out to the fabricator to actually fabricate those openings and, and panels. That's correct. Yeah, and actually the dimension of that, uh, or the number of panels was driven by the size of the room that we were talking about. You can go into eight foot increments, so when you bump that room out eight feet, it actually added another set of panels when you got into your design, your detailed design. So essentially the preliminary planning studies that we did, you see them directly reflected in the shop drawing creation, and then it turns into XML and then goes into fabrication. So it's all interconnected. Okay. Great. Yes. And I think we have a video that shows how the process works, the panelization. Yes. <coughs> so here's the video. Do you see it? Yes. Okay. You want to describe what we're seeing? So this is just um, showing kind of how we jump from the panelization process into shop drawings. Um, so we have a we have an automated shop drawing process um, that'll take each one of those panels um, and create all the necessary documentation, dimensions, so on and so forth. And then we can feed that uh, rather than having to produce paper shops. We have those as a backup. You can see here, you know, um, but we also are are creating XML files directly off of those shop drawings so that we can do very rapid. Uh, direct manufacturing process um, and really cut out uh, when the reason for doing that uh, aside from just time savings is you know, when you're trying to work with many wall panel manufacturers it gives you um, a much better way to commoditize the construction you can get better cost competition um, and then 
it doesn't require expertise on the manufacturer's part to uh, take that information and start building off of it. So you can see we're taking that um, schedule of values from the Revit model and exporting that directly to, uh, to a shop drawing format. Great. A, the video is a little bit long, so I won't narrate all the way through, but you can kind of follow as you go. So this is the XML, the XML file. file. Yeah. And then a manufacturer can consume that file and then start building right off of it. So again, it doesn't, you know, it takes a lot of the nuance out of, um, out of the construction or manufacturing process. We can just feed them a file and they can feed that into their saws and then understand exactly what to do. Right. So that's actually a huge benefit of using BIM, obviously, that BIM generates data and there are plugins that generate other formats converting the data from a geometry to an XML file that then can be used by the fabrication machines that understand this XML format. Yeah. Exactly. It's how, how do you preserve the value of that data end to end from right. early concept in the Enuma system using, you know, from site planning all the way down to manufacturing a part and piece and and you don't, you know, how do you preserve data and, and use it to your best advantage all the way through? Right. So one discussion I'd like to bring up, uh, I'm part of the Building Smart Alliance and uh, standards development and obviously we've been focusing on building common standards across building information modeling tools and IFC is one of them and we all use IFC in other formats as well. But one point I'd like to make here is that even XML format like this, it's not necessarily IFC, but it doesn't really matter. Um, you can, in some cases, if other tools need to use IFC, they can use IFC, but other fabrication tools that can read XML, this is a perfect format. There's nothing invalid about having multiple options here, and that's an important point for us in the BIM storm is to mm -hmm. explore the formatting of data and just that throughput from tools to tools, and there's going to be more and more different applications that want to consume data like this, all the way from fabrication to different things. I mean, there's a lot of other use cases, but this is one very interesting use case because we started from the conceptual requirements from an owner that said, here is we need a 960 square foot classroom to us planning and putting it on site and then ending up in a design, the beginning of a design, a schematic design that was passed to Dara. This actually happened in the last couple of days we were going through this exercise to make sure that we had all the pieces in place. And then Dara last night finished it off with the building that we saw in the slides in Revit, and then by having it in Revit and having your connection to this XML output, you have the fabrication data uh, that would come out and go to fabrication if we wanted to build this. So if Jim says, yes, we want to build it, then you're ready to go with it. <laughs> OK, yeah. great. So let's see. Dara, are you, are you jumping back in here? Do you want to explain the? Yes. What so you real quick, we also want to say that so we have an end-to-end -end approach uh, in design, delivery, and fabrication. So on the other side, we also work very closely with architects. I don't know if you can see that slide. Uh, uh, so we do provide an architectural model with the component model linked into it. And that architectural model actually enables the architects to generate uh, their construction documents. They can use it as a background, or they could even use our predefined preset details uh, to generate a set. So, so you provide very, all these details? Yes, we do. Yeah. We, we provide in series of details uh, in the model. So if the architect chooses to use our details, they can. Otherwise, we can provide our model, the component model, as a background, and the architect can populate uh, the details based on their own uh, building systems. Great. So this is essentially the same data that was used to design the model and then even the fabrication is a different output. Obviously the XML that we were talking about earlier is for the machines to read, but in this case we're going back to the architects to be able to interact with the model and add more information to it, finish, finish schedules, whatever they want to add to it. Is that correct? Correct. And your, so everything your is under one roof essentially. Yep, yep. Great. And the end product? And this is the end like product. This. Yes. Mm -hmm. Happy students. That's our goal. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right. So this, yeah, great. I really appreciate you guys walking through this with us and actually doing an actual exercise of that building for the Solano campus. And uh, it's pretty evident how quickly you can run through these planning exercises. We're not just 
drawing shapes on a plan, we're actually dealing with the actual data that's connected to all the knowledge that you have at Project Frog of putting these buildings together and ending up with something that is repeatable and cost effective and has that quality that uh, is needed. Yeah. All right, great. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit here um, to we also had discussions with other uh, groups. There's another group called Blocks um, that uh, we just talked to last week. And they have uh, a, a similar concept but focused on healthcare. Uh, and theirs is about modular um, spaces and modular components in the building, specific buildings components. For example, the head wall on a uh, patient room and the, the, um, the restrooms uh, in the patient room. So we actually uh, interacted with them and got their information and actually output from the, uh, the SEPS to BIM or program to BIM process, the VA typical requirements for a patient room and a restroom. We just said, okay, let's call up eight rooms. This is live data. Again, if we're talking about data coming from the owner, this is owner's data generating the requirement spaces. And obviously these toilets aren't the right configuration to fit into um, the blocks module, but we can still use these as an initial planning exercise, just like we did with the classrooms, uh, configuring them quickly on a plan and then doing scenarios of how they would fit and then saying, okay, what about this configuration? At this point, we would have a discussion with blocks and say, can you give us information about how this toilet should be set up to meet your prefab modules? and blocks has a family that's actually an entire room like this, we would plug that in, replace the individual components with the blocks uh, family for that room. And then in, the end result would be in Revit, we would have uh, pre-configured uh, toilets as well as individual freestanding components as well as a pre-configured um, uh, head wall of the patient room. So this is a, a similar process again to what we showed with uh, Project Frog. Um, I think there's other companies out there that do similar approaches. So I, th I think this concept of design fabrication and, and being able to communicate with the design teams what's needed is uh, is really getting more and more interesting as a lot of this data starts flowing more efficiently from tool to tool. So we're getting into the last few minutes of this one, and I wanted to end with um, one other theme that we had. This is what happens in the background as we are moving these rooms around in real time. I'm, I'm actually on the web right now, and as I'm saving this, um, it's actually feeding it live into um, uh, another tool that we showed a few weeks ago, which is a portfolio viewer. This is a, the open source tool that we described, the BIM Genie the BIM plan tool in Leaflet. Um, of different projects that are in BIMstorm. And again, anybody that's participating in BIMstorm can have access to all of these um, data. We even have the Kobe Clinic and everything else in here. But well, let's focus in on Solano and look at what happened in Solano that we just did here. So the Solano campus is right here in the Fairfield. And the math and science building that uh, we were just configuring with Dara is right here. Uh, this is live, so there's the, the layout that we left with. Remember, we actually moved the building into position. I can't edit it here, but I can view it. And from here, I can then see the ground floor of this building. There's a layout, there's a components, there's the edits that we were starting to do uh, and save. And the point that we'd like to make is on the lower right here, if you're a software developer, you actually have access to what's called APIs and GeoJSON web services which means you can, just like um, we, saw, we heard from Project Frog, the XML files, um, the, um, the current spaces, for example, are a GeoJSON geometry, which is feeding out, actually I should open it in, uh, let me open it quickly in Chrome, because it formats it more prettily, pretty, in a pretty way. Um, it's machine readable data in JSON format that can be read by other tools, including uh, tools like we saw with the fabrication. So this is actually a, a BIM of every space in that building with the coordinates of the, that space, which means that you could potentially use it to do this kind of panelization exercise from directly from here. So if you imagine that from end to end early planning, pushing data in neutral formats like this, and we're inviting uh, software developers to actually um, try this out. This is actually live in the BIM storm, so you can actually see these plans actually as they're being worked on of the entire portfolio that we showed, healthcare planning and other projects as they start popping up around the country. We're going to be in Wisconsin at the uh, healthcare conference in, in a couple of weeks showing the clinic there. So anyway, if there, um, we're going to have a webinar next week. Um, and the 
webinar next week is going to be focusing on uh, data and design validation. So tools like Invicara that goes through and does uh, model checking and data checking. Uh, the owner asked for this type of uh, square footage in a building. What does it look like now and how, how are we doing on the square footage and equipment in the building? Are, and are we matching the requirements? And we have a few more minutes. There's a few questions that I see coming in online. Uh, comments about uh, liking the paperless process uh, for shop drawings um, and uh, uh, Dara or Mike or James do you have any uh, last comments or thanks for joining us today and sticking around yeah. thanks yeah. for having us thanks for having us yeah thanks for having us and I think yeah thank you very much Jim and um, I think we're going to see a lot more of this. This is just the beginning of an exercise for this planning exercise at Solano, and we're going to continue on in, in other similar workflows in the BIM Storm. And we invite anybody who'd like to sign up and join the BIM Storm. If you go to bimstorm.com, if you haven't joined yet, um, the login uh, page for future webinars is here. And then if you join the, um, the BIM Storm Data Independence, down here there's a, a, a join button, sign up access. You will get access to free tools and all the data that we showed you here for the projects, and you can start your own project as well. And we want to thank our sponsors again for helping make this happen. And we'll log off today, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Next week webinar is going to be on Wednesday, October 12th at 3 p.m. Eastern. So this is Kimono Numa, BIMSTORM Data Independence, and we're logging off for today. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.